just yeah. put more and more and more and it's like the liquid so, grows. But they're good at, at scrubbing things. They're good at scrubbing things off the floor. <laughs> so. But yeah. Well, I always give Malik a, uh, a handkerchief. He's got a drawer full of them, I'm sure. I do have a drawer so. full of them. And actually, you know what? I had the blue one you gave me. It was in the car and I brought it for that purpose and I still left it in the car. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so. Well, good to but. see everyone. Good to see everyone. Uh, if you can, now is the time to have your camera on. But if you, uh, once we start the lesson, feel free to, if you want, you can leave it on or just turn it. That's a good time to turn it off so you can, you can focus on what will be shared today. Uh, but what we're going to do today uh, is we will have a lesson and we're going to get a treat today. We're going to have numerous people uh, who have prepared in advance to share. They're going to share uh, to illustrate and really give us a living testimony of the lesson today. And then at the end of the lesson, I'll, I'll pray. At the end of the lesson, I'll pray and, and uh, we'll have communion together. So make sure as usual to have your bread and the fruit of the vine prepared in some way, shape or form to celebrate Jesus uh, after the sharing of the lesson today and the sharing of the testimonies today. So I hope you get a lot out of today uh, as we enjoy this time. Uh, this you muted yourself, Curtis. You muted yourself, buddy. No, not you, buddy. Yeah, so. Listen to you, buddy. I was muted, but it's okay. I'm back now. Let's see here. Give me one second and we will start. Is this last week? One second, we'll let a few more people come on in. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get uh, things started here. Uh, our theme this month is Jesus is Lord, or uh, perhaps better said for the whole month is one Lord, as we've really focused on those scriptures, all those sacred ones from Ephesians chapter four. And today is a continuation uh, for many of us. Uh, I hope everyone had a great Easter. Uh, today is a continuation of this theme of Jesus is Lord, and really excited to share the good news. The tribe, uh, they are on their own Zoom call today, but I did want to pass along the good news if you have not heard it. Just a few nights ago, David, who is being buried in the waters of baptism in that picture, David was baptized uh, in our tribe ministry. So great to see Josh and Malik there. Uh, just baptizing David into Christ. So we look forward to getting to know uh, David better uh, in the times to come. So that's David there. So I'll go ahead and uh, lead us in a prayer and we will jump into our lesson uh, for this morning and, and some of the sharing that we'll have that goes with that lesson. I did want to have a special prayer request today. This was passed along to me from Brian Santos. Uh, please keep your brothers and sisters. Please keep your brothers and sisters in St. Vincent in your prayers. Of course, we have this incredible missionary partnership with the churches in the Caribbean. And we had a special missions update just about a month ago from one of the brothers in St. Vincent. And he referred to an active volcano that they have there in St. Vincent. If you haven't heard the news, that volcano has begun to erupt. And so uh, 20,000 people in St. Vincent that are close to the volcano had to be evacuated. I believe this all happened yesterday. 
Uh, the country is now in lockdown uh, with stay at home orders uh, because of the ashes and the air quality. Uh, so far, the disciples in the church are doing well, they're doing fine, and they are safe. Uh, but it really is another dose of reality um, as we have just uh, brothers and sisters and people all around the world that are, are facing very difficult uh, issues and problems, and, and they're quite traumatic in nature. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll keep uh, the church in St. Vincent and that island in our prayers as well. So let's bow our heads and pray as we get started here today. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Uh, thank you so much that we can spend this special time together today. Uh, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Uh, what an incredible, inspiring teacher he is. What an example. Uh, he is the way to live life on this earth. And yet, God, we know that he's so much more than that. Father, he is the Lord. Jesus rose from the dead. I pray, God, that that becomes more and more reality in our lives that inspires us, that motivates us, that guides us, that, that, that keeps us faithful, that keeps our eyes on the cross, that carries us through difficult times, that helps us to persevere in relationships. Uh, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection that gives us hope that there's more to this life than what we see right now. Father, we know that outwardly we're wasting away, but with Jesus and the hope of the resurrection, we are being renewed day by day. Father, help us to focus not, on, not only on what is seen, but is what unseen in front of us as well. Uh, we pray, God, for our world today. Uh, we pray for our leaders uh, whether we are in line with their thinking or not, I pray for our leaders, those in authority, Father, knowing that nothing has escaped your thoughts or your grasp, nothing uh, happens without you allowing it to happen. I pray for those in authority in this country and all around the world that you work in such a way that the gospel will shine and your people will have an opportunity to shine and represent Jesus. Uh, we pray for the island of St. Vincent. We pray uh, for the devastation and the, and the fear and just even the air quality, the air we breathe that we can take so easily for granted. I pray for them uh, as that volcano has erupted. We pray for the disciples. We pray that somehow, some way, light will shine in the darkness as these things happen. We love you, God. Again, all of this is because of Jesus. Help us to and everything that we share today, everything that we give in our attention and just being on this call, that the glory goes to Jesus and nothing else and no one else. We love you, God. We praise you. All these things we pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus is Lord. Our theme is one Lord. And just... Taking things here briefly uh, before we have some people share and really encourage us this morning and remind us why Jesus is Lord, I did want to backtrack to Sunday. I mean, it's all about the resurrection. If we're only following Jesus because he's a good teacher or even that he died on the cross, if that's where it stops, if it ends on Thursday or Friday on the cross, then we are to be pitied among all people uh, because we don't have hope. But see, that's not the case. Jesus rose from the dead. The tomb is empty. It's a historic fact. So do we believe in that? Well, if we do believe in the resurrection, we really have no choice in a sense. I, I mean, we always have a choice, I, I guess. But if we really believe and with conviction that Jesus rose from the dead. Just as we sang that song earlier, if we believe there's power in the name of Jesus, that death, hell, and the grave could not keep him down, then we say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That is our good confession. 
And what we looked at for those of us who were together on Wednesday night, and, and this won't be unfamiliar to many of you as well if you weren't with us Wednesday night, we do have to consider what our good confession means. We made a confession that Jesus is Lord in front of many witnesses. What does this mean for us? Is this our lives or is it just something religious that we said? What does this commitment, this conviction, this confession, this confession of Jesus is Lord, what does this mean for us? And I'm probably way too old to use this phrase, but Jesus is our ride or die. That's what it means. And we have to consider our and think, is Jesus your true ride or die? Is your undying loyalty, come what may in this life, is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your ride or die? What stirs your emotions? What stirs your passions? What takes you this way and that? Is it something else or someone else besides Jesus? Jesus must be the Lord of our lives. And there are five ways, probably many more than five ways to check. Uh, these are some areas that we covered earlier this week for some of us, but this is just, uh, just good to review briefly. But if Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord of our hearts. That means he is at the core of every decision that we make. Jesus is our ultimate cause. Jesus is our ultimate passion. And we always have to recalibrate our hearts so many scriptures about the heart, uh, namely Jeremiah 17, 9, where it says, hey, be careful with your heart. The heart can deceive you. All right. We need Jesus as the captain of our hearts. Jesus is the Lord of our possessions. All of our resources ultimately belong to Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of our relationships. Jesus is the Lord of our time and our attention. I added attention on here because there, it's such a competition these days for our attention. Where are those precious resources going of time and attention? Jesus must be Lord, and Jesus is Lord of our purpose, the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are just some heart checks. If you went to the doctor, you'd have all your vital signs checked, right, before they even looked at you intensely. The, uh, usually the nurse would come in there and uh, hear check all of these different vital signs. It's very important to continually recalibrate this lore of our lives. And so what we're going to do at this time is we have some people, uh, they know who uh, who have been uh, Sorry, I just told Marcus that he's frozen. He'll be right back. Where did I get frozen? All right. Sorry about that. I'm assuming you can hear me again. Shake. If you can hear me, shake your head. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Very good. Thank you. Sorry about that. We have about four devices going here at our house, middle school here and the elementary school. So uh, my apologies uh, that you lost me. But uh, where we were there, and I, I don't need the screen anymore. Uh, I was just, I'm going to put this in the chat for you. But what we're going to do at this time is we're going to have some testimonies uh, from different folks who uh, can share with us and remind us uh, of why they made Jesus Lord. So we'll have a group of people. We've pre-selected them. Uh, they'll first answer the question, 
why did you initially make Jesus the Lord of your life? And then we'll have another group of people who will share after X number of years as a Christian, why do you still have Jesus as the Lord of your life? Why are you hanging in there after all these years to have Jesus as the Lord of your life? So I'll put those questions in the chat so you know exactly what's happening here. Um, but the first one we're going to tackle is just that initial decision of Jesus raised from the dead. The confession's been made. This person was baptized into Christ. Jesus is Lord. We're going to have some folks share their testimony in about five minutes. They're going to be, you know, rather brief. I'm sure they could go very, very long if they wanted to, because uh, everyone's story is more than five or seven minutes, of course. But we'll have a, a few people share here, and I'll just call you out, and we'll we'll make sure everyone can see you. Uh, we're, we've asked a few people to share why Jesus became the Lord of your life. That'll be our first question that we'll do. I'd like to start with, uh, we'll start with Gene. Gene, if you can unmute yourself, we'll go with uh, Gene first. And then if Matthew Balk uh, can get ready, Bubba Balk can be next. We'll start with you two guys. But uh, Gene, just go ahead and unmute yourself and please share why you decided to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. Um, today I'm Seneca Saints here. <laughs> I logged off under my um my um my login my login. Um, yeah. So thank you for for the opportunity to share why I made Jesus the Lord of my life. Um, you know, it's funny when you ask a question and I was asked to to share. You know, I had to kind of go back so many years, right, to just kind of figure out what was that original initial response. And and as I started thinking through that, you know, I was back in college. You know, 19, 20 year old you know, sophomore in college. And, you know, when I start going back to why I made Jesus Lord of my life, I could only break it down to maybe three simple concepts that make sense to me. Um, the first thing was truth. Um, I think, you know, that I was seeking truth. Uh, and then the other piece was, you know, there was a sense of liberation um, that came with, you know, knowing Christ and, and, and making him um, Lord of my life. And also, obviously, the sacrifice that um, that ensued. Um, so I like to start off with truth. So for me, initially, you know, growing up as a kid, um, I just felt like there was always different variations of truth that were out there, um, whether it be biblical truth or whether it just be, you know, worldly views or worldly truth. But I just remember never really getting the full picture, never really getting the full answer. And so, um, you know, the choice of being baptized was made for me as a child. I was baptized when I was born you know that's typical for caribbean kids to get baptized um and so just growing up i was going to church but not really not really being engaged you know so i thought for me i was sort of like that perfect person or that perfect guy or that perfect kid um but just just remember you know my first semester in college or second semester in college and then um i was reached out by it was a very strange way how how the whole thing happened i'm going to skip that piece because we don't have enough time for it but the point is, I just I started studying the Bible, and I just remembered the 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 astonishment of the fact that I did not know the truth, like the truth, truth, right? And so what and, and what I mean by that, you know, in John chapter one verse nine, it talks about how you know Jesus is the true light, and the true light was the Word, and the Word became flesh. And to me, that was like, okay, that's true. That's a foundation. That's something that I can build on. And I just remember thinking to myself, you know, over the course of my Bible studies that I was just really being misled and not really knowing where I was going and so forth. And then, it, and then as I continue to go through my Bible study, especially the word, um, I think that was the most impactful Bible study for me, because that's really when I learned the truth. And John 12, 48 just talked about, you know, how Jesus is the truth and then how the word um, will judge will judge me. And then going back down to John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32 where Paul talks about just, you know, if you hold on to my teachings, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And there was the liberation aspect of, you know, of Jesus becoming Lord of my life, and just first understanding the truth, and then being liberated by it. And then lastly, as far as we talk about the aspects of, um, of sacrifice, so for me, I think, you know, if you look back in Acts, Acts chapter 236, you know, where Peter talks about, um, you know, right around the the time of Pentecost. And, you know, he said, you know, God has made this Jesus whom you, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, 
you know, and then the, you know, and the folks who were there, the believers who were there said, you know, uh, what shall we do? And then, you know, and, and then he responds, repent and be baptized. And so we start off with the truth and then we start off and then we kind of navigate to the idea of being liberated. And then you end up understanding what the sacrifice that was made for you. And then, so for me, it was just really the process of gaining that truth um, that helped me to make Jesus Lord. Because prior to that, no one explained that to me at all. You know, people told me I had to go to church. I had to get baptized. I had to do my first communion. But no one explained to me the truth of Jesus and who he was and why he did what he did and, and what that all meant for me. And so for me, I would say I made Jesus Lord of my life because I understood the truth. The truth was taught to me and I was able to hold on to it. It liberated me. And because of that, I understood his sacrifice. Thank you, Marcus. Amen. Thank you. So Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Jean. I think that helped us all. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, as we continue here, why did you make Jesus Lord of your life? Let's hear from one of our UCF campus ministry students, uh, Matthew Bubba Balk. Yes. Good morning. Um, thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, that actually helped a lot with me with what I'm going to share. And, um, you know, uh, it wasn't that long ago, actually, that I was baptized. And so I can vividly remember, like, the turning point of what made me want to become a disciple and make Jesus Lord. Um, and so what really changed my view was I had one study with um, my disciples, and they were showing me how I was um, basically the rich young ruler out of Matthew 19. Um, I grew up in church my whole life. I knew all the stories about Jesus. Um, I was a little bit numb to it at that point, but um, I felt like I had everything. You know, I kept the, I kept the commandments, quote unquote, and I, I did everything right, quote unquote. And, and um, it wasn't until I realized, you know, how sinful I was and how broken I am and how Jesus can repair that and wants to repair that and wants to restore me and make me something so much greater. Um, once I surrendered that, uh, I realized I needed him and, and um, gave up sin. You know, it, it was just like, there's no going back at that point. And uh, I vividly remember a scene from uh, the passion of the Christ. And there's a part where Jesus is carrying his cross and he falls down and uh, Mary sees him and, and she thinks back to him when he was his son uh, and when he was younger and, and just that, I couldn't imagine watching anyone go through that period, but imagining my brother, my Lord and savior do that for me, it really just convicted my heart. It really changed my heart. It really broke me to see that someone loved me that much um, so much more than I could even begin to fathom. God just loves me so much. And that, that was something that was drilled into me during my studies, which is how much God loves me. And it still blows me away to this day. Um, I'm, I'm committed disciple to this day because of Jesus' love for me. Um, and so, uh, of course, you know, this isn't all about perfection and, uh, this is progress, you know, Jesus just loves each and every one of you so much, like, and if that's not enough of a reason to make him Lord, I, I don't know what is, so yeah. Thank you, thank you, Bubba, and I, I think that's just such a great perspective, too, of someone who is part of a generation, uh, several generations uh, of followers of Jesus and making Jesus Lord. And yet it had to come from you, from deep, from within, and uh, to see your need for Jesus and, and where he could take you and the hope he could give you. So thanks for sharing that. I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. We'll have, we'll have two more share uh, why they made Jesus Lord. Uh, and we're going to finish this segment with two Kevins. All right, we'll have Kevin Boyle share why he made Jesus Lord. Then after Kevin Boyle shares, then we'll have Kevin Merrigan 
uh, share next. So Kevin Boyle, if you wanna start us off here and then Kevin Merrigan will follow you. Hey man, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, last time I did Zoom, I kind of hopped in and out and uh, froze a little bit. Um, gosh, it's a week prior to me being baptized in 1987, um, I thought I was ready to, to make Jesus Lord. I just had one, one conversation with the brother that was studying with me. I said, I wish God reached out to me when I was in my 50s instead of me being 21, because I, I just would like to like, like to live life a little bit. So he smiled gently at me and uh, was really loving with me and then shared, you're not ready, Kevin. I said, no, I'm ready. I, I, I'm definitely ready. But he goes, I want you to think about what you said. I want you to go home and I want, I want you, to, I'm not down about it. I just want you to think about what you said. And so I had read, somebody instructed me to go through the medical account of the crucifixion. I read it and I realized what I said, you know, and it just broke my heart that I had, uh, you know, did not realize that God wanted to save my life immediately and have a relationship with me, me immediately. And I wanted to kind of like put it off. So I, I wasn't ready. So a day or two days before I got baptized, I was at midweek in the Arlington Church building up in the Boston Church of Christ area. I remember sitting in midweek feeling completely alone, completely safe. Sorry, my cat is walking in front of me. Completely alone, completely safe um, with the brothers and sisters who were, who were loving up on me. But I knew that I was separate. And I didn't want that life anymore. I wanted... You know, I wanted Jesus. I remember sitting there thinking, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I remember thinking I didn't know what that meant either. But I, I knew I wanted him to be the Lord of my life. And there was an immediate sense of I'm okay with whatever happens. I'm okay with whatever happens. It doesn't matter. Whatever happens, Father, whatever, whatever happens, I just want to be at your feet. So on January 9th, 1987, I studied the. I started counting the cost January eighth at ten o'clock at night, nineteen eighty seven, and it lasted until two o'clock in the morning, January 9th, Because I, you know, um, the brother that was studying with me was sharing some things, but he said one thing. He said, "Kevin, do you understand that if everybody around you falls away, you can't. It doesn't matter where you're at, you can't. Do you understand that?" And it took me some time, and I really and I really grasped that. That has happened a few times in the church in 30 some odd years of being a disciple where I've seen that happen, but I've always recalled and what that brother Preston Shepherd shared with me that you can't, you know, you, you've made Jesus Lord of your life. And I've always gone back to that, you know, John six, verse 67, Jesus is asking the disciples, you do not, you do not want to leave too, do you? Simon answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy one of God. To not make Jesus Lord, where else am I going to go? There is no place else to go. So I, I remember I felt that, that it, it felt so freeing to make Jesus Lord, not knowing what that would be for the next 30 year, two years or however much longer I live for my life. But I remember I felt completely vulnerable and completely protected by, by the scriptures, by the words, by what was taught to me. Um, there was no doubt that Jesus was Lord when I rose up from the waters of baptism at 2.30 in the morning with eight sleepy people watching my baptism. But uh, it was great. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. That's super helpful uh, as the Oviedo crowd cheers. Uh, the conversion of Kevin Boyle. And so uh, Thanks for sharing that. And yeah, a couple of things really stood out. It really connected early on for what Gene shared in John 12, 48 is, hey, it's what come, you know, whatever comes, Jesus has to be Lord. And, and well, I, I think God protects us. We we have we have so little knowledge when we first get baptized. I don't think we could handle uh, everything if we knew what was coming. And but it's just that attitude that Jesus, wherever Jesus takes me, that's where I'm going to go. Uh, I know the apostles couldn't have handled it uh, if, if Jesus had told them everything before he left. Uh, but thanks for sharing that. Where else could we go but to Jesus? And uh, thank you, Kevin, for sharing that. Um, next, we'll go to the Merrigan couch. 
uh, and hear from Kevin on why he made Jesus Lord. And then Odessa, if you could go after Kevin and transition, uh, the next question after Kevin shares is, after X amount of years as a Christian, why is Jesus still the Lord of your life? Why are you still following Jesus? So we'll go ahead and have Kevin share why he made Jesus Lord, then Odessa can share why Jesus is still the Lord of her life. So if you guys want to unmute yourself and Kevin, you can go ahead. I'm looking for you guys on the call. I don't see them. Oh, they dropped off the call. They must have hit the wrong button. Okay. Well, we can go back to them. Um, unless they join any time in the next second or two. Well, I'll tell you what, Jason Tomlinson, he looks very ready. Uh, Jason, why don't you go ahead and take us into our next segment here? We'll go back to the Merrigans. When they come on, we'll, we'll have them. But Jason's going to kindly share for us uh, why Jesus is still the Lord of his life after all of these years. Thanks, Marcus. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. All right. Good morning, church. Um, you know, I, I got to get out of my own way because this thing has kind of racked my brain for a few days. So let's just say a quick prayer before I spend five minutes telling you anything. Um, uh, just uh, Father God, just uh, as we come before you, just let us be humble, God. Let us be uh, open, uh, transparent with our lives that we can uh, uh, have your light come down and uh, share a message with all of our hearts. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, amen. Um, so you know, my, I kind of titled my lesson, right? It's like, why after 25 years of being a Christian, right? And so let's see, March 31st, 1996, I was baptized in this church uh, at the Heather Glen Apartments on University Boulevard. I think I counted the cost a few days before that on the 28th. And, you know, then it's just a Sunday after campus, right? To kind of get wet and get washed, right? So you got to live with that stress, but um, until you're clean. And, you know, it never stops after that. Like, I'm always screwing up. I'm always making mistakes. I'm always having to go to Jesus and other people and beg for forgiveness. And, you know, that's just part of our life, right? We chose to become disciples where we weren't important or more important than what God was trying to do. And, um, you know, like, we just have to be like maybe his chief begging officer in whatever we're trying to do in life. And it can't be about what we're trying to get for ourselves. Uh, or it doesn't work, right? Because anything we do ourselves just dies at the end, right? It's the, the universe will end in a fiery death and we know it, but anything that God does is outside of that. Um, and that's what we, you know, we put our hope in that. So um, let me just start by reading a few things Jesus said to his disciples and, um, you know, just pick Matthew 18, verse 15 to start with. It says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take two or three others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven, depending on the translation. That's a big number. Right? It's a number we should never hit when we're sinning against somebody else. Um, but I've already racked up a few of those myself. So I'm only here today because of the Lord's forgiveness. I've personally been disfellowshipped on more than one occasion for an unrepentant attitude or creating a conflict with another person uh, or being in sin. Um, you know, Jesus has graciously restored me back into his church three times in my spiritual life. And truthfully, it's many more times than that, that he's determined those events. Um, you know, I've prayed Jesus into my heart and had hands laid on me. I've been baptized in really big mega churches. I mean, I've tried a lot of different things to, 
know and seek God and I, you know, I'm not there, you know, I'm, it's a, it's a journey, right? The, the gates of heaven are a long ways away and we got to work to get there. And so I repented of my sins each time and God let me back into the church. That is why Jesus is the Lord of my life, because we need to submit to every authority in our life. And if we don't, we are inciting rebellion. And I know because I've done it. So I'm just thanking you guys for listening to me today because, you know, I'm grateful to be called on to share something with you guys uh, and some of what Jesus has done in my life. Um, you know, some, let me just jump to another scripture. Let's jump to Romans chapter three and let's start in verse nine. And that says, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power or all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. And then verse 17, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Right, so the law teaches me my sins where I fall short. Right, and then let, it continues in verse 21. It says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus, right? So, my lordship story to Jesus is the story of God's son making the choice to sacrifice himself for my sins, and my story of continuing to fall short of his glory when I try to imitate him every day on my journey to heaven. And the reason Jesus is my lord is because he's continually having to cleanse me with his blood after I repent of each of my sins so I can maintain a right relationship where I walk in the light all the time. Right? Whether we call that 24-7 Christianity, we call that sold-out discipleship, what it means is that no other idols should be robbing me of my spiritual integrity. My job should not be robbing me of my spiritual integrity. And I believe Jesus reconciled me to what the world would call a normal relationship with an ex-wife and an oldest son that I treated like crap. I mean, I definitely sinned against them in anger, in frustration, just things I didn't understand what God was doing in my life. And he appointed the times and places for everything I went through. He appointed when I met my wife, Johanna, in Toronto, and how because of an everything bagel, I witnessed her citizenship in her ceremony in her country. And because of what somebody said that day to us, why are we boyfriend and girlfriend? Like, next thing you know, we're married right? Two years later or so, right? Not two years later, but in, after two years after meeting the first time when she thought I was a jerk. So God can do anything in anybody's life. And I believe it a hundred percent without doubt, but you have to surrender totally to him. You have to trust him with everything. You have to clear your idols, right? It just, it, it doesn't work any other way. And so while we've been patiently waiting for his return, Jesus is near, according to Paul, so I need to spend my time helping Jesus with whatever he asked me to do in his kingdom here in Orlando or wherever else I get to go until he appears. Um, so I, I know without doubt that I can do nothing apart from my father in heaven, from Jesus at his right hand, from the Holy Spirit that's here to comfort us when we go through some of these struggles. Right. And we have to walk in reverent submission to God's authority over us. If we don't, we get in trouble. I, a night of drinking and dancing, I ended up in jail. You know, if God didn't actually send somebody to go get me the money in a foreign city and get me out of jail, I wouldn't have made it to work the next day. I, I would have been so embarrassed. You know, so God protects us even when we do stupid stuff, but his sin, our sin, you know, it has an expiration date on us. There's a day coming, a day of reckoning for each of us. And 
I was kind of worried today was my day of reckoning. And I wanted to make sure like, hey, all my idols were clean. I, you know, I had to talk to my wife. You know, I didn't have the most pure relationship with her when we dated. And she was my sister in Christ. And I had to make sure that she forgave me, that everybody knew that in her life, that we were transparent with everybody. I don't want an Ananias and Sapphira moment in my life where we both fall dead before all of you guys. Okay, because God is real and we need to fear what he's doing. You know, I don't need him walking around my house seven times waiting for my house to fall down. Like, no, I'm going to surrender my life to him and let him use me. So that is why I fall at his feet in lordship with all humility and why I desire to do my best to relinquish whatever control my heart wants to take in a situation, in any challenge I'm getting, because he can deliver me from my own errors and I cannot, right? So he gives me a choice to respond to every conflict I'm in. I enter with love and submission to his father's will. He showed us how to do it in the gospels. It's possible. Or I can just be frustrated and angry with God and take it out on other people when things don't go the way I think they should be going. And my job is to read the tea leaves. Like I forecast businesses for a living. Like the Old Testament would call that maybe a son of Issachar or something. But you know what? I'm not right. Right? God shows me more than what I try to figure out on my own. So, you know, I can respond or even worse, I can run away with pain. And I've run away from churches before. I've run away from avoiding pain or avoiding saying what I believe. And, you know, Jesus has called us to teach the world to obey what he commanded us. And if we're not doing that, and I haven't really been doing that, I invite people to church to hear the message. And I hope you guys give them a great message to convict them. But that's not the right heart either. You know, I, I need to do better. I need to be focused on the real mission and not letting other idols in my life distract me. You know, I spent many years running around this world after some letter came out and my whole family left this church. And that was 2003. And, you know, I met a lot of great people all around the world. Um, I visited Masonic temples in New York, Toronto. Like, what else have I done? I visited the Mormon temple. I, I went to the Vatican. Like, you know, I all over Notre Dame, like Amsterdam, like looking for love, looking for wisdom, going wherever God sent me on my next journey, hoping I would learn and understand even more. But the truth is, is like we, we've had it all the time if we just understand who Jesus is. We don't have to find that love anywhere else. We don't have to feel like we miss it. I mean, gosh, I remember I used to, like, I think we take for granted that we used to have these one another relationships that were like having spiritual coaches to help us. And it was constant coaching. I paid for that in the world with something called landmark education because I knew I needed it in my life. I needed to be broken, but we don't want to do that to each other because we're afraid to hurt each other. And I think Amen. God expects more from us. Amen. So helping others know King Jesus fills me with every spiritual gift I need to understand my own character. I don't need to go looking in the stars to figure out my own character and my issues, and what I need to do to close out my past wounds, because if I'm just studying the Bible with somebody, and teaching them about King Jesus, God reveals all that stuff to me, and I deal with it in such a healthier way than what I thought I would have had to do. So this is the beauty of God's plan. By wanting to help others to know him, we get to wrestle with others in their life-changing challenges. We learn to trust and rely on God more and more in a lasting, eternal way. The identity before that I was chasing after my divorce, you know, that whole time, that, that's all found in God above. Like he put that spark of creativity in us that we can go create new things, right? But the world tells us to go chase ourself because you know what? Yeah, you'll find something, but it also ends in death. So what's the point? Chase God and you will find yourself in reality. Amen. Well, thank you, Jason. Oh, yeah. This is great, great stuff. I really appreciate it. Did you? I, I interrupted a bit, but we were a little running a little short on time. Yeah, Was yeah, there yeah. One no, final take it over. Thing? I had a scripture to read, but you can take it over, Marcus. Maybe you guys. Right. Are <laughs> thank you so much, yeah. and I'm so thankful for your passion. Uh, you preached for us, and, and I think your life does that. And uh, you are an example of God's mercy. And dare I say, like I just love the way that you shared. Um, you shared so humbly, uh, if this makes sense, the irony of it, you shared 
uh, in humility about your lack of humility, if that makes sense. And uh, I think that awareness is so huge for all of us to stay close to Jesus and love Jesus. So I'm really thankful to call you my brother, and I'm really grateful uh, for what you Amen. shared there and the passion with it. Thanks, and thanks for I, me it sounds like you had more to share. So I, I think, I think, you know, like, share it to people, you know, share that message to people. It's going to go a long way uh, to bringing them to Jesus and helping our group as well. So thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. Um, let's go with, uh, do we have Kevin and Odessa? Kevin, are you there? Could you, could you share why you became uh, a disciple of Jesus? Why Jesus is your Lord? Then Odessa can take it from there. Yeah. No, I just did. On, on. We hear yes, you. I'm we hear you. Okay, yes, I'm here, and thank you, and thank you, Jason, appreciated that, and um, I will say, unlike what Kevin Boyle shared, I had spent a lot of time in the world, so uh, Sunday, uh, first Sunday of 1988, I made Jesus the Lord of my life, and um, because my answers had gotten, um, my questions had gotten answered. So I was kind of raised in the Catholic Church, but left that early. But I'm grateful for that because that set a foundation for me about Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. But uh, because we didn't study the Bible, I really, that, that step that I, that I was being asked to take to be a believer was so large. And so about the time I was 17, 18, I started studying other things. And I studied a lot of different religions over a period of 17 years. I studied, um, you know, metaphysical things and things from parapsychology and astrology and all, all of those things. And I kept a, a bookshelf of all those books. But I always kept the Bible as the first book because I hadn't studied it. And, um, and the good news is that I met someone. But prior to that, I met someone who called themselves a practicing Catholic, and that intrigued me. So I got with that person and started going back to the Catholic Church, and we attended a couple of what I would call midweeks, which was the study of St. Augustine. And I could see that <clears throat> it lacked heart because it was all about the intelligentsia of St. Augustine and that meeting and discussing it, but not really doing much about talking about your life and so I kind of stopped that relationship but continued to continue going back to the Catholic Church and then one day after I came out I just I think I literally got on my knees or close to that out on the street and just really surrendered myself to Jesus saying Lord it's been 17 years and I've come full circle I've come back to the Catholic Church from when I was a kid, and I still don't feel, I've learned a lot of things, but I don't st still feel any closer to you. So I certainly uh, don't have those questions. I don't have that, those, those, those answers that I needed about how I can have the faith to believe in you. And um, sure enough, when I did that weeks later, I was invited to a to church, to our church in New York, and um, to a Bible talk, and I kind of blew that person off, but then God had a plan, and he, he knew it was my time, because the very next restaurant that I worked in, there was a disciple, and she had been around for a while, so she kind of sized me up, and she didn't invite me to church right away. She just talked about the church, which I really appreciated, and she talked about her life, and how what she was learning was helping her. And so after a couple of months, she, um, she invited me out to Upside Down. And I said, wow, this is, this is a different church. So I said, you know, I'll come to that. The Upside Down show was at Hunter College in New York and I'll come to church the next Sunday. So funny story, I went to the Hunter College uh, to see Upside Down and about the third act, um, we were all, there was a bomb scare and the, the show was stopped and we all had to leave and I'm walking around Hunter college and I'm separated from the person I came to with. And, um, 
I'm wondering, I said, this is weird. Either the bomb scare had something to do with Hunter College, or maybe the bomb scare had something to do with this church. And if that's the case, either they're doing something radically wrong or they're doing something radically right. And it's scaring people. So I came to the Beacon Theater the next, um, the next day and I saw what I imagined and, and probably didn't even fulfill everything that I imagined. There was more. And I, I knew, uh, I watched the fellowship and I watched people stay for 20, 30 minutes afterwards. And so it was, okay, check off the fellowship, it's there. Check off the biblical teaching, it's there. Um, you know, there was just these checks. And then, so I started uh, weeks later attending a Bible um, study group in the daytime. I was a member of the daytimers. Um, and, um, and then I asked that Bible uh, talk leader, Jeff Sackinger, I said, hey, this Bible talk's really good, but can we get deeper? Because I'd wanted to really get deeper and, and get into the Bible. And sure enough, by doing that over the next couple of months, uh, I got my questions answered. And that's, you know, we studied discipleship in Central Park and it started snowing. And Jeff said, do you want to leave? I said, no, I don't. And it was like icing, you know, it was hailing. And we stayed there and those guys stayed with me and we studied it out. And my questions the truth, someone mentioned, the first speaker mentioned about truth. Truth became apparent to me. The big step of believing that Jesus was the son of, of God was a much smaller step because I got to study the Bible. And um, particularly, there were particular scriptures in closing. There were particular scriptures that really helped me. Second Timothy 3.16, where the Bible talks about itself. All scripture is God breathes. And, um, and is useful for rebuking and correcting and, and training. And um, that this was, a, this was a passage that I, I needed to be trained and I needed to take the initiative to, to train myself in, in God's word. And then 2 Peter 1, uh, 25, above all, we didn't follow cleverly invented stories. And I was like amazed that it's actually talking about itself. And these are the questions that so many people have. Surely that's interpretation and, and all that thing. And then the thing that really summed it up in closing was uh, James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. And it, it told me that it's all about following it and not just because so much of the world would call themselves a Christian because you know, maybe they read their Bible, but it was much more than that. And, um, and then finally, Jesus's love that he showed on the cross, the way he came to this earth and lived basically as a poor person, and his love for us, and then that very difficult thing, justice, and love and justice being carried out. Those are the things that really helped me easily make my decision and so the first sunday in 1988 in the beacon theater i was baptized so that's it why jesus is the lord of your life thanks for sharing that odessa you want to share why why jesus is still the lord of your life we'll have odessa share and then we have just a couple of more to share and then we'll We'll have communion together after that. But Odessa, please go ahead. Um, man, I've gone all over the place with scripture and um, everything that has continually um, my gratitude. Um, I've been a disciple for over 44 years. So that means I became a disciple as a teen. I mean, not that old. Yeah. Okay. I just lied. <laughs> so God hears me. But um, I'll never forget. Um, as I looked at the scriptures um, and listened to a teacher tell me about Jesus, his love, God, his love that he would give his son um, and falling in love with Jesus. But over the 44 years, I've had to fall back in love with Jesus many, many, many times. Um, I am thankful. Um, I've had 
great times as being a disciple as a college student. Um, great times being a disciple as a single person in New York City, a single woman in New York City. Um, um, a college student again while I was there. Also dating and marrying, I um, married um, a friend. Um, we got to know each other, Kevin and I, and I'm so thankful. Um, but every one of those steps, there's been different things that I've had to learn to, I've had to go back and fall in love with Jesus and um, know that I think one of my favorite scriptures, um, I have many, is in um, 1 Peter 2, 4. It says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like a living stone, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Um, so many times, um, just pieces of my life that were rejection, pieces of my life that um, I thought should have gone a different way. Um, but each time, God considered me holy and precious. God walked me. Um, I, I will say one of my toughest times um, holding on and knowing that the only way I could breathe or get out of bed was after the loss of our son. Um, almost seven years ago. I'm going to read a little piece that I wrote because it'll be easier um, to communicate it. Um, um, here it is. Our, um, on May, May 2014, my husband and I lost our 15-year-old son to suicide. I was the one who found my son only minutes after the incident. My world, I knew, was turned upside down. During the next few days, weeks, months, years, life has, has had many changes. I have learned to hold to God, to lament to him, grieve and mourn with God. I thank my God each morning I can breathe due to the pain, sadness, or being so intense at times. I'm thankful for my family, my church family, close friends, counselors that have, that have walked alongside of me in this journey. This journey has taken me many places. However, it's a part of my story. I have asked God to show me how to use my pain. A gift he has given me to use to helping others. Um, I have learned during this time how to lament. Um, I'm still working and learning to be able to give wholeheartedly to my husband, my daughter. Um, I've been asked many times through my walk the last seven years, how could I love God? Um, after losing my son, I can only say that if it weren't for my love for God, I wouldn't be here either. Um, it wasn't for the, his love and given me Kevin in my life and given me Tara in my life and now her husband Chandler. Um, I am thankful because those are the glimpses of joy that he's given me. He's given me the glimpse of joy of amazing relationships through the 44 years or more a part of the church. Um, he has um, taught me that he will hold me no matter where and how, how I may fight to live or fight to think, um, but he's there, he's constant. Um, I can't imagine life without him. I can't imagine life without the people in my life um, because God has placed them. Um, I am eternally grateful 
and I'm eternally grateful that I get to um, continue to walk with him, uh, that he continues to love me, continues to tell me I'm precious and holy. And I think so often we need to hear those words because we forget them through our walk and through our journeys. Um, I would have life no other way without Jesus. And that is, you know, that's pieces of my journey, pieces of my love and my appreciation and my gratitude um, that he loves me no matter what. Um, Cause I'm not always lovable, um, but I'm just thankful. I'm grateful. Amen. Thank you guys. Thank you, Odessa. What love you, what Odessa. Great, Thank you. What a great testimony. Um, what a great example of holding to God's unchanging hand, uh, Jesus being the rock that you build your life on imperfectly and just doing the very best you can uh, through the most difficult uh, circumstances. And that's definitely an understatement. So thanks for sharing, Kevin. Thank you for sharing, Odessa. Thank you. Uh, before we share, before we, uh, thank you. Before we share communion together, we had a couple of more uh, testimonies we wanted to hear. After these years as a Christian, why do you keep coming back for more? Why are you still following Jesus? So I uh, want to go back to the UCF ministry, uh, the campus ministry, and I think Kyla was uh, up next. If, if she's still on the call, if you're with us, uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself and please share. Okay, so can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm like driving, so, so like hopefully it doesn't go like in and out, but okay, so after five years as a Christian, Jesus is the Lord of my life love and trust him with all my heart. I know that he will never leave me and that he will always be there for me. Even through the times where I am struggling and my faith is wavering, he never left me or is ashamed of me. I know that God is my savior, father, and my best friend. And I know that the love I have for Jesus will never fade away, no matter what happens. After five years, I have never read making Jesus Lord of my life. That was the best decision I've ever made in my life, and it was the happiest day in my life. Nothing will ever come between me and Jesus, and he is the Alpha and Omega. Jesus is the Lord of my life because there's no greater, there's no one greater or higher than him. I want to learn to love others the way he did and have strength, have the strength like he does. He is not just a part of my life, he is my life, beginning and end. I, know, I don't know where I would be right now in my life if I didn't know Jesus. To follow God, I would be a totally different person today. I would have lived a simple life, been with friends, and for the better. He knew that. I needed people in my life for me, and that's why he led me to this church and ministry. God is the only one that really knows me because he's been in my life from the beginning. Oh. And knowing that Jesus died on the cross for me to have all my sins forgiven so I can be a new person and be with one with him is the reason that I made Jesus Lord of my life. Even when I'm struggling with friendships and loving myself, God always had my back. It was my forever friend. He promised me that good things will come and to look up and love myself the way he sees, it views, and loves me, which is beautiful, which is beautiful, amazing, his child and his child. And not to worry if other people don't like me because he will always love me. And when I am not sure about what to do with my life, he tells me, don't worry. I have big plans for you and you can do anything, everything that you ever dreamed of because with me, all things are possible. Knowing this and keeping and believing his promises to me is, is why I still hold on to on tight and love him forever. I know that with when everything is fading, he will always be there and never lose his sight in me because our God is everlasting and faithful and 
will never leave us even when we are struggling. And I know that I will see my Savior and Father one day in, hev in heaven and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have never lost the battle, even when it was hard for you. I strive to be like Jesus in every way that I can. He is faithful, loving, compassionate, and ultimately my forever. And I think um, one scripture that I always held to was Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And I just like, that's like my, one of my favorite scriptures. And I just want to keep on holding tight to that. Amen. Thank you. Well prepared, beautifully said. Congratulations on five years as a Christian. And of course, we all are excited to see many more of those. So thanks for sharing. Thank you. So before we take communion, we have one more to share. Uh, we're going to have uh, Chris Rios uh, from Oviedo uh, share why he's still a Christian. We're very thankful that uh, the Rios family moved back to Orlando last year. Um, so we're very grateful that Chris gets to share for a few minutes, and then we'll we'll have a prayer and share communion with each other in just a moment. But uh, yeah, Chris, go ahead and unmute yourself and 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 please share. Awesome, thanks, Marcus. And uh, I want to start by thanking everyone for sharing and being vulnerable because it's not easy to get in front of people and just share about your life and and share about things that you've gone through. And um, it to me it it makes it all more real because we're all humans and we're all in this together. Um, I got baptized 11 years ago in May in 2010 by Jamie. His wife is right here. He's watching the kids. Um, I got baptized in campus and I don't think looking back, I, I really knew what I was getting myself into. I don't, I don't think that I knew how um, intense, how crazy, how, uh, just life happens. I, I don't think I, I really grasped that when I, when I got baptized, because I was in campus, I was having fun. And, um, after about three years, I ended up walking away from the church. And when I, when I had left, it was like, I just want to party. I, I want to experience things that I didn't get to experience when I was a Christian. So I left and, you know, there was many times where God you know, was trying to bring me back through, through many people. I would, I would see other disciples throughout Orlando and they would ask how I'm doing. They would ask, oh, we should come to church. And at the time it was like, I'm just, I'm having fun. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. And then um, I ended up meeting Lindsay, my wife. And we went through some, some crazy stuff early on. And it was actually her. Lindsay was saying, hey, why don't we go to church? And she, she didn't, she didn't come from a religious background. She didn't come from a family that went to church and she was the one that initiated it. And she said, Hey, let's go to church. So I rekindled my relationship with Jamie and she started studying the Bible and, um, I ended up getting restored and, you know, we ended up moving to Tampa and Lindsay ended up finishing her studies in Tampa and got baptized. Well, as soon as Lindsay got baptized, we had only been married for about three months. Bam, Lindsay's pregnant. So that was like, holy cow, we're about to have a baby. I just got married. I just got restored. My wife just became a disciple. What is going on? Um, so Zachariah was born, uh, our, our, our son. It was an amazing, emotional, beautiful experience. But what followed that was a very horrific accident where my wife was having to not only take care of our son, but also take care of me um, because it was wrong place, wrong time. Um, and that whole accident really changed our lives. You know, now I look back for the better, but at the time I thought it was for the worst because not only did it put a financial strain on us, we had a newborn baby. Um, my wife wasn't working. It was just, our life was a mess. And I, I really didn't know what to do. Um, in my mind, it was fight or flight. And what I turned to was, you know, addiction. I, I turned to an addiction. I turned to 
something else other than God to make me feel better. And, and ultimately it ended up leading to a, this was about two years ago, an explosive incident in our marriage where I did things that no married man should ever do. And, and it almost cost me my marriage. It, it almost cost me my salvation and my life ultimately. And, um, when all of that came to light, I remember sitting on I-4 contemplating, like, I just, I have a loaded gun in the center console of my car. I just want to end it all right now. I, I want to be done with it. And, um, you know, I was in the car by myself, just yelling and, and yelling at God, why is this happening? And for whatever reason, I put my foot on the gas and I just hauled straight home. And um, from that point on, God's grace was really, really at work. And I think after 11 years, that's what's really, among a thousand other things, God's grace is just, it, it, it's so sufficient. And the scripture that I, I think of is in uh, 2 Corinthians. This has been my theme scripture for like the past year and a half, um, just because it applies so much. And in 2 Corinthians 12, where are you? Paul is writing and he says, he's talking about the thorn in his side. And it says in, in verse eight, three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. And then Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And then if you drop down to verse 10, it says, I delight in my weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. And when I, when I repented of my sin, I, I, it left a lot of scars and it left a lot of, of wounds that are finally healing. But with that came a lot of anxiety and a lot of just, I feel like I've had to, to plead to God just to take this in extreme anxiety away from me. However, I'm, I'm almost grateful that I have it because it keeps me grounded. It keeps me leveled that I have to rely on God. I have to rely on Christ. And because of his grace and, and everything that he's done, and even the grace of my wife for, for taking me back after the things that I've put her through, it's just, it's, it's supernatural. I, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it any other way. Um, you know, and I, I'm very grateful for the church. I'm very grateful to, for the people that have been involved in our lives because without them, you know, we, we wouldn't be here. I certainly wouldn't be here. Um, so I, I, you know, God's grace, his love, his mercy, the sacrifice. Um, and then there's another scripture that I want to read as well. It's in Luke 15. It's talking about the prodigal son. And, you know, this, the son left, he left to go live this reckless life to be, you know, to, to fulfill his own desires. And when he realized that this world, this, this life that I'm living, it's not satisfying me. It's, it's actually killing me. And he comes back and he, and he tells his dad, just make me a servant. I just, I don't, I don't care. I'll be the lowest of the lows. And the dad says, no, I want to, I want to celebrate. You're coming back. So he says, my son, the father said, you are always with me. He's talking about his other son and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And I feel like I, I, I was dead, um, you know, and when my sin came to light and, and it surfaced and I, I really experienced what God's grace was. It's like, now I'm alive. Now I'm found. I'm dead to my sin, but I'm alive in Christ. And, um, so yeah, that's that's my story. My amazing wife right here. She's put up with a lot of my my madness, and um, but I don't think she would have it any other way either. So, thank you for letting me share. That. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Thank you for those incredible scriptures as well that brought it to life. And uh, yeah, just even make sure you read some of these comments uh, in the chat. Your mom, I'll read this one. There's no better love than a love of a mom or a dad. She says, thank you, my son, for sharing. 
I'm so proud of you. God really is faithful. I love you. That's from uh, your mom, Nancy. So, amen. Well, I, I really I I thank everyone. Thank everyone for sharing. <laughs> I thank everyone for sharing today. We had some great stories of, of, of how Jesus called you and how Jesus brought each one of us uh, to call him Lord and to make him Lord of our lives. And then uh, equally important, uh, many of you sharing like Chris and others very vulnerably, your comeback stories. Uh, you know, and just think about Chris and, and Jason and just you sharing and being example of the mercy of Jesus. Um, thank you for everyone that, that shared today. Um, it was very moving. All of us have our own stories and we need to hold on to those. And uh, that's what this is all about, is uh, in different ways, making sure we take the time every day, but specifically taking the time on Sunday to celebrate the Lordship of Jesus. This is not a burden. Uh, we all know if we think deeply what our lives look like when we start taking the Lordship away from Jesus in different ways. That is a dangerous path, but with Jesus as Lord, his mercy never comes to an end. It's a solid rock to build our lives. Uh, it's a yoke that's easy and kind, unlike the yokes of the world and the yokes of our own desires. Uh, Jesus is good all the time. And because he rose from the dead, we have the hope of eternal life. So with all these testimonies in mind and just the glory of Jesus being the Lord of our lives and the hope that we have of heaven to come, let's go ahead and say a prayer at this time. Uh, and we'll remember Jesus with the fruit of the vine and the bread. And so just a few minutes uh, of just reflection here, and then we'll say goodbye to each other. Let's go ahead and pray at this time. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Uh, we thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you that he has showed us the way that Jesus is the light. As it was said today many times, Jesus is is the truth. Jesus is grace. Jesus is compassion. Father, you always take care of us during even the tragedies of our life that are unexplained, and we just don't know if we'll ever feel completely the same from them uh, as was shared today. And yet, Jesus continues to be our solid rock, his teachings, his way of life, his sacrifice, his resurrection. Uh, thank you, God, that when all else gives way, uh, when we don't seem to see the good, we can look to Jesus and that we have eternal life. We have a new life. We have a secure and firm anchor for our souls. Father, I pray today that these testimonies uh, have drawn us closer to Jesus, more thankful for Jesus, knowing that we all have our own stories. We humble ourselves before you and King Jesus. We celebrate his sacrifice at this time for the forgiveness of sins. God, this grace that we've talked about today, the, the unending grace and love we know came at a big cost, uh, the blood and body of Jesus. Help us to remember that this time, uh, to find comfort in that, and be quick to forgive others because of our own sins that we have as well. Uh, we pray all these things only in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's just take a few moments now and uh, take the, uh, the emblems uh, of the communion. And uh, we'll come back in just a, two or three minutes and say goodbye.
All right. Well, I hope everyone is super encouraged. Uh, I hope uh, your lordship to Jesus is strengthened. Uh, of course, we're all a work in progress, but we have each other. So I hope these are just things that we're going to be discussing that we'll talk about with one another this month and in the times to come is just to help one another all the more and encourage one another, spur one another on to continue to put Jesus on every area, uh, the throne of our lives. Like he's, he's, he's number one all the time that he is our ride or die. So thank you so much for everyone that shared. As Chris said, that's not easy to do. Uh, maybe even harder in this format. Uh, so thank you everyone so much for what you shared. Uh, and I pray everyone has a wonderful afternoon, a, a great week. Uh, for those of you who are family group leaders uh, and you're a part of the meeting that's coming up, we will get back on this call at 1215. We'll give ourselves a little, uh, we thank you family group leaders and continue to encourage your family group leaders. They have another call coming up. Uh, just how to better serve you. So uh, we'll have a group of our family group leaders come back on the call at 1215. But uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. And uh, have a wonderful week. Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Marcus. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Love you. Thank you. Love you. Miss everybody. Thank you, Barry, for handling the uh, the ushering today. Yes. Hey, guys. Great stuff, Jason. Great stuff, right. American. Okay. Thank we'll you. talk on Friday, Tony. Trying to figure out. Sorry, guys, we had an electrical outage here during all of this. <laughs> We had to go. No worries. We were, we were getting some lightning strikes over here as well. So yes. yeah, well, lightning struck something here and turned everything off and caused my computer to go chaos. Well, I think it was God's okay. way of saying amen and shaking things up. There oh, tell me about it. There you go. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. No one's <laughs> okay, out. All right. Love you guys. Bye, everyone. Bye, Marcus. Bye. <laughs> Marcus, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, do you want me to continue um, letting people in and that sort of thing? I think I can take it from here because it's a smaller group. So you can take a relax. You can chill. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Every once in a while, my, pers my cursor would freeze and you would get to things before I could get to them because my cursor just won't respond for about Sometimes 10 seconds, it's, it's the craziest thing. I can't figure out what it is. Well, hey, I lost my signal too. And it may have been the lightning. It may have just been all the devices happening here. But yeah, it was a good time together today. So yeah, it all worked wow. out okay. Yeah, ama amazing. Uh, very powerful. Yeah, amazing. It's, it's yeah, very powerful uh, testimonies there. That's Amen. Great. That's great. Amen. You just see how great. God works uh in, in uh in, in amazing ways uh even with 